four teams are still standing in the Kelly Cup playoffs. We'll look back and look ahead. Off-season shifting continues as one team makes a coaching change. We'll hear from one player who's dealt with a very personal struggle this season. And we hope you're sitting down. A divisional rivalry has been taken to the next level. That's all right now on another expanded edition of ECHL Week. Hi, welcome to another edition of ECHL Week. We've got a lot of ground to cover today, including plenty of stuff about the Kelly Cup playoffs. Let's get started. Let's start today with the Western Conference Division Final Series. They were both good ones. Let's look at the highlights. Weidman up top to Atwal, slides to Canodal. Left wing blue line, rolls one on goal, turned aside in front. What a save! And played ahead for Devontae Stevens. Stevens in the near corner, and they score! Off the corner board, Stevens! Threw it onto the goal and it deflects off of Pat Nagel and just squeaks in. The walleye keep it free. Register in the slot right on and Jenks scores. Register from the slot. Brendan Cuddick fires it on. Turned aside by Hauser, but Greg Wolf picks up the rebound. And it's now 2-1 Toledo. Up to Judd Peterson, turns a corner, Peterson backhand on goal, rebound in front. 56 to go, Atwal holds it in, tipped right on goal in front, and Canodal couldn't bury it. Back up top, there goes Hauser, on the back door, what a save! Oilers with a quick shot, sharp angle, goes over the top of the net, up to the right point, a shot and a save, rebound, a shot, they score! Ryan Tisic! Makes his return to the lineup and strikes first for Tulsa. And back around the left wing for Mraz. Mraz leads it out to center ice and Idaho will work on that change. Bredo gave it away. It's a breakaway for Payne and he scores. Payne goes five hole on Williams as Bredo handed it right to him. He tried to clear it across the rink and the game is tied at one. Held in by Traplock, taken away and it's a breakaway for McParland. Shorthanded in on Williams to his backhand and a save. Rebound. They can't get the shot off on the rebound. And Canisto will skip it across the rink. Pleskatch in behind the defense right circle, fires a shot, he scores! The captain puts Tulsa back in front, top shelf at the halfway point of the second period. Petrick at the half wall, carries it to the point, stops there, tries to play it across, picked off by Perfetto to the empty net, he shot it wide, Pleskatch will beat the icing, and he scores! And it's 3-1 with a minute 43 to play. Adam Pleskatch has his sixth goal of the series and his third empty netter. And that game comes to an end from the plains of Oklahoma to the top of the mountain. Tulsa has a date with Toledo in the Western Conference Finals. The sixth straight home win for the Tulsa Oilers since game two of the Mountain Division semifinals, an overtime win that night against Kansas City. They win the Mountain Division Finals in six games. A coaching change gets us started as we look at news from all around the ECHL. The South Carolina Stingrays have joined the list of teams making a coaching change for next season. However, the Rays have already found their man. Assistant coach Steve Bergen has been named as the ninth head coach in team history. He'll replace Spiros Anastas, who was relieved of his duties after spending one year as the bench boss of the team. Bergen has been with the Stingrays since 2016. He served as the team's assistant coach during that span. Throughout my three years here, I'd say I've taken two things away from um, the singer organization the most and that's the winning culture the standard of it and um, how much this truly means to so many different people I promise you I'm gonna do everything I can in my power to keep that winning tradition going I'm gonna work as hard as I can to put a product on the ice that you guys are proud of and you guys can stand behind Bergen was part of the Stingrays Kelly Cup finals appearance in 2017 and helped the team to its best ever regular season record the following year he spent five seasons as a player in the Southern Professional Hockey League from 2011 to 16, which included three league titles with Pensacola. In other bench news, the Reading Royals and head coach Kirk McDonald have agreed to a contract extension. It's a two-year deal with a team option for the 2021-22 season. During his two-plus years leading the team, McDonald has a record of 76, 52, and 19. A right wing on Reading's Kelly Cup title team of 2013, who spent most of his pro playing career in the American Hockey League, he's the Royals' seventh coach. The team will begin its 19th season in October. 
The Indy Fuel and the Chicago Blackhawks have signed off on a three-year affiliation extension. The deal runs through the 2021-22 season. The Fuel originally became Chicago's partner in 2014, just prior to Indy joining the ECHL. Among notable Fuel alumni is goaltender Colin Delia, who has since appeared in 18 NHL games with the Blackhawks and is under contract to Chicago. We hear from a player who talks about his challenging medical issue and his return to the ice, next on ECHL Week. This is nice. Happy anniversary. Is that what I think it is? I don't know. It's a hockey stick. There's more. A puck and skates. Oh, Ed. You nailed it. The other one's in the car. Hockey's here. The savings never left. Geico, proud partner of the NHL. NHL players have amazing talent and some of the very best developed right here in the ECHL. Reeves with a wrist shot and scores! Now, follow all your favorite ECHL alumni every night on NHL Network's primetime hockey show, NHL Tonight. Both teams recognize how big this matchup is. Fire save by Dupin. Rebound! Goosebump stuff. NHL Tonight, every night, 6 Eastern on NHL Network. I'm Derek Shepard of the Florida Everblades, and you're watching ECHL Week. It's easy to forget that hockey players face challenges off the ice as well. We talked earlier this season with Adirondacks Shane Conacher, and he talked about the trial he faced this season. Beginning of the year, I felt good. Um, team got off to a pretty good start, and I was feeling good. And I want to say it was end of November, beginning of December. Um, something started to feel a little off and it was it was kind of one of those things that was always on my mind and uh, something that was always bugging me I, every time I'd practice every time in between periods I'd come off the ice and, and see if I was if something was wrong or so I finally middle of December I went into my trainer's room and I I told her kind of something was bugging me and uh, the doctor had checked it out and she said she said give it two weeks it didn't really go away and it was continuing to bug me and um, I remember the last game on New Year's Eve I believe we played Newfoundland and um, I just kind of knew something something was up and so we had an ultrasound done uh, the 2nd of January and they found a small mass in my testicle that th they were concerned about so um, they, they worked really fast. I, w I went to see a specialist in Saratoga and I mean surgery obviously was a su success and, and they got rid of everything that all the cancer that was in, involved and it didn't spread anywhere which was which was a big thing. When you're talking about going through cancer having a positive support system is really important. Conacher talked about his. Obviously it's something you never expect or predict and um, obviously it's a part of life though and having gone through what I did and um, the support I had with the team, it, it, it kind of made me realize how important hockey is to me. Um, I mean, you, you come to the rink every day, you're with these guys all the time, and uh, when I got the news and I had to kind of go home, go to the hospital and get everything checked out, it was, it was tough for me. It was tough to be away from them. It, I mean, obviously it was nice to be with family and stuff at the time, and, uh, and, and, and you, you just realize how much support you have in the hockey world when, when stuff like this happens. If you look at the positives, testicular cancer is, is, a, is one of those cancers that it's easy to beat and hopefully never comes back again. But um, yeah, it's, it was it was scary. It was I mean, you always have those those thoughts going through your head, and and some days were obviously better than others, where it's like, oh, what's what if it's spread? What if it's something else? Where did it come from? Kind of thing. So While he was going through medical treatments, Conacher had several unexpected encounters. You don't really know until you kind of go through something like this, kind of who, who's who's gone through what and. And it's it's kind of a it's it's a weird thing because I had a couple people message me that I didn't know went through it, and one of the players was actually in playing in the ECHL. I'm not going to name his name just for 
personal reasons, but he, he reached out to me and said I just, just had gone through the similar thing and, and if I had any questions to, to ask. and um, So it's always nice to kind of connect with someone. I mean, not, not nice, but it's nice to have someone to talk to and, and to know that, that how they're doing now is, I mean, they're doing great and playing, playing hockey again. And um, also I had, I had friends back home who a, a friend reached out as well saying, like everything's gonna be okay, and I mean it's just that positive thinking, and you gotta have a positive mindset through it all, because you don't want to go through the dark days or or have the worry on your mind all the time. In early March, more than two months after he left to have surgery and recuperate, Conacher returned to the ice, and that night was a very special one. I was I was saying to some of the guys, it, it felt like one of those games where where everyone was just trying to set me up for a goal, and and I had a lot of better chances earlier on in the game that I probably should have scored on, and. Um, it was one of those things where, where you, you don't expect the guy to pass to you because he has a clear shot to net, but they're trying to set me up. It, it, it was a weird, it was kind of a weird feeling, but um, to get the the goal late there, it was I was actually trying to pass it back door, and it, it happened to get deflected in. But um, yeah, it, it was such a crazy, crazy experience and a cool feeling that that to tie that game up. And obviously, it was a, it was a big point, and the, the fans gave me a nice warm welcome that opening night. And, They've been so great through it all as well. The Thunder qualified for the postseason, but was eliminated in the first round of the Kelly Cup playoffs. But in the future, when Conacher thinks back to the 2018-19 season, he'll have a smile on his face remembering such a great outcome off the ice. There's just so many people to thank. There's so many people that, that I want to reach out to that probably don't know that I want to reach out to them to thank them for everything, the letters, the messages, and um, that are on deck. The Thunder community is just it's all time and I mean I, like I said I can't thank people enough for for making this season kind of how it, how it turned out to be. Hi this is Rob Murray head coach of the Tulsa Oilers and you're watching ECHL week. South, North, let's look at the two division final series from the Eastern Conference. Rowe picks it up on the far wall as the defender pitches down to the goal line taken away and Fegis turns on the Jets it's a two-on-one with Soppy. Fegis rips one score! Short-handed goal! Hunter Fegis gives Orlando a 1-0 lead! Beautiful break out there for the Solar Bears. Fegis had the option with Sompi, but as the defender, Patrick McCarran, dropped to his stomach to take away the lane, Fegis was able to snap it and beat Booth to the club side. Downing, left point, fires it around the boards. Far corner, it's Auger who tries to pick it up. Fry battling with a few cross-checks there. The play still continues, back to the right point, McCarron to the line for downing a shot, score! A little bit of traffic in front to screen Connor Ingram. Bears keep play alive, Manfredo across, one-timer saved by Booth, looked behind, couldn't see it, kept in at the point by Spencer. As it glanced off the stick of Winnicky, Spencer a shot through traffic, loose puck, saved by Booth, squeezes the pads together, rolls through the crease, a backhand try by Thompson, knocked away. Flipped ahead for Tamala, trying to cut wide, drops it off. Here comes Burke moving in, shot and a save by Booth. And he is pursued by Cox. Cox stumbling, swipes it into the slot. Neville shot off the post and out of play. And now Platzer moves in, left side for Neville. A little stutter step there, finds Cox, the trailer, right circle, unloads, drive and a save by Ingram. Puck rolls away through the crease to the far corner. Slides it down low in the corner. Kukali continues to battle to the front of the net, Burke a try, backhand and a save made by Booth, he'll reach out and cover up. Tamala finds Thompson, backhand pass, holds with a shot, blocker save by Booth behind the net. It's Lohan, feeds it out to the slot, holds backhand and a save by Booth without his goalie stick. Platzer to Berkovich, all alone, a shot by Masella, saved by Ingram and it's batted away by Manfredo. What a defensive effort there for the Bears and Shane Bourne is hauled down, it's going to be a penalty. Knocked ahead, Shane Bourne moves it over the line. John McCarron turns it over, a chance for Dylan Fitz, swept away from him by Logan Rowe, a turn, shot, saved by Booth. Downing, tied up at the circle, Holtz moves in, waits, shoots, blocked by Downing. How did that one stay out? Left side, a scramble at the net front as Booth tries to get back in position. Flipped ahead, Ingram at the trapezoid, turnover, McCarron shoots, scores. And the Solar Bears season comes to an end as John McCarron wins it 2-1 in double overtime for the Florida Everblades in the fifth game of the South Division Finals. 
and Orlando's season will come to a close. Lead of power. He'll look to hit center ice. He is dumped by Pierrot with the growler still moving ahead. Zach O'Pine in the left wing corner, all the way out in front, he scores! What a goal for Zach O'Brien! Make his goal streak six games here in this postseason run, and it's 1-0 Newfoundland! Green pack up, there's power again. Back up top to the point for Garrett Johnston. He'll send it, he scores! Zach O'Brien's got another run! Couple of tries, pull this side door, Bradley tried a shot, what a stop at the end of the goal post. Redirect and score! the line and Johnston scoops it right back up and finds Bradley. It's a two on one. Come on, Go Johnny. Yeah! 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 Garrett Johnston, yeah! happy yeah! birthday, baby. Top of the left wing circle, Ferguson, down low, out in front, they score! A hat trick for Zach O'Brien, it's five nothing Growlers. Cameron Easy looks up top, big scrum in front underneath Gertag. How did that stay out? It's still up. They score. Wow. Pack your bags, Growler fans. Your Growlers are going to Florida for the Eastern Conference Championship. A Game 6 victory here at home. Your Newfoundland Growlers are North Division champions. Previews of both conference final series when ECHL Week continues. I had to work to get to where I am. Nothing was given to me. I'm not the biggest. I'm not the strongest. But I will work the hardest. I drink Cocoa 5 because it keeps me hydrated and lets me focus on doing what I love. This game takes a toll on my body. But I can't take any days off. It's a grind. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Cocoa 5. Keeping you in the game. Eva Marie smoked 12,000 packs of cigarettes over 15 years. She quit, and now there's a new lung cancer screening that could save her life. You stopped smoking, now start screening. No matter how much you smoked, early detection could save you. Talk to your doctor or learn more at savedbythescan.org. Nobody likes an awkward silence. You can actually use it for something good. You haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. Hi, I'm Aisha Visram of the Adirondack Thunder and you're watching ECHL Week. Just four teams left looking to play for the Kelly Cup. Let's preview both conference final series. The Western final pits Toledo in its third conference final in the last five years against Tulsa, a team which prior to this season had never won a Kelly Cup playoff round. Previews of this series will talk about Tulsa's top line of Steven Perfetto, Adam Pleskatch, and Alex Dosti, which has accounted for more than half the team's points during the first two playoff rounds. But at this point in the postseason, secondary scoring is key, and a pair of Oiler Blue Liners will be important in that area. Former Lake Superior State stars Eric Draplock and well-traveled Steven Canisto are numbers four and five on the team in playoff scoring. The Oilers will need their offensive contributions. Experienced Greg Wolf and Dylan Sadaway, along with a couple of relative newcomers, David Pope and Zach Galland, have handled much of the scoring for Toledo in the first two rounds of the playoffs. A player to keep your eyes on is veteran defenseman Matt Register, who remarkably has been a member of the last three Cali Cup teams, including when he was playoff MVP two seasons ago. The man who's played in more Kelly Cup playoff games than any other is the only walleye with more than one power play goal this playoff season. Special teams are often a key determining factor in playoff series. Both teams have been excellent with a man advantage in the playoffs and decent while shorthanded. In goal, Pat Nagel of Toledo and Devin Williams of Tulsa have played every minute of their team's games in the postseason. Williams led the league in save percentage. Nagel brings 60 games of Cali Cup playoff experience to this series. 
In the East, Florida, which finished last season one victory short of a Kelly Cup title, will take on Newfoundland, which didn't play its first game until October. Blake Winicki and John McCarron have led the scoring parade for the Blades this postseason, but the head-turner in the playoffs has been defenseman Ben Masella, who after managing 18 points in the regular season, has 10 points in 11 playoff games. Newfoundland Zach O'Brien has been sensational in the playoffs, capping off the team's elimination of Manchester in the North Division Final with a hat-trick. But this is a balanced team. Seven other forwards have multiple goals this postseason for the North Division champions. Captain James Molindi, a longtime ECHL defenseman, can be distracted or be a distractor, but he's certainly a player who can't be ignored. He'll see plenty of ice time for Newfoundland. Special teams-wise, one number stands out. The Everblades have allowed just two power play goals in the playoffs, and they've been shorthanded 38 times. That's a crazy good percentage. If Florida keeps that up, they'll be tough to beat. Speaking of being tough to beat, Florida goaltender Callum Booth is 6-1 in the playoffs, and that loss came in overtime. His postseason numbers are terrific. He leads the ECHL in both goals against average and save percentage. The Growlers will counter with Michael Gartag, whose numbers are not as head-turning, but are skewed in part as a result of an 8-2 loss to Brampton in the first round of the playoffs. In an odd coincidence, especially considering they're from different divisions, these teams started the season with a pair of games against one another. One of them will end the season against the same opponent. Hi, I'm Jason Christie, your Jacksonville Iceman, and you're watching the ECHL Week. Voices of the ECHL. Today, Colin Shuck of the Idaho Steelheads. Tell us about your duties other than play-by-play. Instead of broadcasting on the road uh, and at home, um, I handle the media relations duties, so day-to-day -day media work. Um, I also help with a team of uh, two other people, help plan social media work and content. So it's really a team effort from all of us to handle the social side of things. Um, and then on the road, it's helping with equipment travel, um, helping arrange travel with that as well. And uh, we always joke in the office, other duties as assigned. So just like in any minor, uh, minor hockey team, uh, you're always doing extra things than what you're supposed to be doing. Um, so it becomes a little bit more fluid but generally speaking um, it's mainly media with again other duties as assigned. What's your favorite arena from which to broadcast? Anytime you can play in an NBA facility, um, usually the amenities are pretty good. Um, I really like going to Toledo and Huntington Center. Uh, there's another really good set up there um, and again you had that uh, atmosphere and you know in juniors and, and in college that was one of those destination teams that looks the coolest and so it, to be able to go there uh, from a facility standpoint uh, is really nice and they can pack in 8,000 real hard devoted fans and uh, in the same vein uh, BOK Center in Tulsa is much of the same way I was there when they had over 10,000 fans one game they opened up uh, the upper curtain area and when you get places like that jumping it becomes a really good home atmosphere. Do you watch games differently now that you broadcast them for a living? You find new ways of looking at the game. Yeah, I'm going to listen to the broadcasters first and foremost, and in my own preference, I'm going to turn on the radio broadcast before I even turn on the TV broadcast. Um, just because I like listening to the words that they use, the type of tempo and the type of um, intonation and pacing that they use. Um, but for watching the game, just sitting around with coaches more and more, um, that makes me watch the game in a different way of seeing how the players develop, what they're doing, and even recognizing play development, special teams, zone entries, things like that. Um, I didn't grow up playing the sport, I grew up a fan of the sport, so uh, having that background environment now and, and the knowledge base to go along with that, um, that's what's really changed of it. What's the best part of your job? Yes, the broadcasting is probably the most fun. That's what you look forward to because you get to entertain, you get to improvise and be a little bit theatrical. Um, but for me, being around people, um, being able to tell stories, learn from them, enjoy other experiences with other people, whether it's fans, coworkers, players, or people that you meet along the way. Um, there's always a story to tell. Um, every person has a story to tell, and there's seven billion of us. Not everyone gets to do it. So um, the opportunity to tell those stories and be able to be part of that environment, um, there's something unique about entertainment and sports itself and being an entertainment vehicle for people. And to be able to share that experience with other people and talk to people about that experience, um, it's something Something that you really never get anywhere else. We're always on the lookout for interesting stories about life in the ECHL. Here's one which ramps up the intensity of the rivalry between Cincinnati and Fort Wayne just a little bit. Let's hear from the guys behind the trophy with the longest name in the ECHL. Uh, Shane and Fort Wayne were in Cincinnati and uh, I think we had a show in our building. Uh, 
not too long before that and uh, where the visiting press box was in the stands there was a, a broken seat so there was no seat um, where he sat so I said, yeah, we took it out for you to make some more room. I know you get really animated, and which he really doesn't, but uh, so I said, yeah, I know this is yours. And by the way, I've got the seat cushion here. The seat was actually, uh, it was broken. It was just kind of hanging there. And it was like one of the seats where, uh, where the visiting broadcaster sits. So I didn't think anything of it. I kind of made fun of Everett. I'm like, well, what happened to the seat? And no, no explanation. It's just kind of sitting there out of a row of seats is the only one that was broken. Everything else was perfect around it. So I'm wondering, what's the story behind this broken seat? So the next game we come back and it was only a couple days later and the seat was finally broken. It was just laying there. And I said, Everett, what is this? And I said, it's our trophy. This is now going to be our traveling trophy. Right here it is. <laughs> but we mutually agreed to have uh, the the trophy for uh, for our game. So now whenever the Cyclones and uh, Comets get together, we play for the trophy. We battle for the uh, Comets Cyclones Broadcasters Challenge Championship Memorial Traveling Seat Cushion Trophy of America. I think I, I just thought of every type of championship trophy you could think of, pieced it together, and then Everett added, of course, the cherry on top of America. <laughs> Photos, the photos were my idea when, I, when uh, I claimed the trophy the first time. I wanted something to memorialize uh, this very tremendous event uh, of beating not only Fort Wayne, but beating Shane Alberani as well. So I said, you know what, why not get a photo of him looking all dejected and sad, uh, myself looking very happy and victorious, uh, and post that on social media for all the world to see. It's the way it was the first time it was spontaneous and now literally uh, last Sunday when the horn sounded I yelled at Everett, Everett it's time and Everett and you have to do the walk of shame you've got to go over to the victor and you've got to get your picture taken so that is the rule now. So I've got a shrine in my office I've got a space cleared out on, uh, on a shelf in my office and I put it up there and I've got a few photos of Shane from when we've won it, uh, of me being very uh, jubilant and joyful and Shane is not as happy. So I've put those pictures around the trophy uh, to symbolize that I've won the trophy. People are, are actually enjoying it. Uh, they, they're liking the, the trophy pictures that, that Everett and I both post. And uh, you know, Everett and I, we've always had a great relationship and we always love to have the bragging rights. We've been doing it for years, but now we actually have something tangible between us that we can go back and forth with. But yeah, uh, people People have enjoy it and also other broadcasters have also really liked it too. It's, it's a comfortable cushion but it is very awkward to carry around. Yes, it is a, it's a comfortable seat and uh, it's more comfortable when you have it in your possession. I, like I am very proud to lug that awkward trophy, that heavy eight pound seat cushion around with me when we win it. Well, uh, I, I think it's going to keep on going back and forth and uh, I, I hope it does because it has really turned into something that we really enjoy doing now and it even makes the games even that more fun. To wrap up this story, we get a note from Shane. The cushion is currently resting comfortably in a locked, undisclosed location away from sunlight and possible saboteurs. In other words, it's up in the press box at the Allen County Memorial Coliseum awaiting next season. Friday, October 18th, the cushion goes up for grabs again. That wraps up another edition of ECHL Week. Thanks for watching. Make sure to follow us on all our social media channels, especially on Twitter and Facebook. This time of year, we update all the time with every game in the Kelly Cup playoffs. We'll join you again with another expanded edition of ECHL Week in two weeks as we wrap up the conference finals and look ahead to the 2019 Kelly Cup Final. I'm Barry Schickling. See you then.